$50 trillion was just found under Antarctica. Antarctica is the only continent where mining has never occurred, despite having valuable underground resources. This is mainly due to the Antarctic Treaty, which reserves the continent for peaceful and scientific purposes. Article 7 of the Madrid Protocol specifically bans any mineral resource activities. While this ban isn't a law, Antarctica has no government to enforce such laws. No one owns Antarctica, and only about 5,000 people live there temporarily, mostly in small research stations from 32 countries, with populations halving during the harsh winters. Initially, anyone could set up a base in Antarctica, but the extreme conditions deterred many. In the 1950s, the number of stations and population increased significantly. Seven nations, including Norway, Australia, France, New Zealand, Chile, Argentina, and Britain claimed parts of the continent, with some overlapping claims. The US and Soviet Union also established research stations for strategic purposes. One reason the US, under President Eisenhower, pushed hard to stop Antarctic claims was to prevent the Soviets from making their own claim and possibly setting up bases there. It was also part of a post-war idea to solve conflict through diplomacy, uphold human rights, and fight against authoritarianism. Eisenhower supported keeping Antarctica peaceful. The seven nations with claims, Norway, Australia, France, New Zealand, Chile, Argentina, and Britain, along with the US, Soviet Union, Japan, Belgium, and South Africa, met over 40 times to reach an agreement. There were intense debates between those wanting sovereignty and those okay with international governance. The Antarctic Treaty was presented in December 1959 and ratified two years later, with Chile and Argentina being the last to sign. The treaty states that no country can assert, support, or deny territorial claims in Antarctica, effectively freezing all claims forever. Despite the Antarctic Treaty, there were still arguments over who really owned parts of Antarctica. Many countries with claims were unhappy about giving up what they saw as their territory, future resources, or potential future cities. Australia and New Zealand tried to legitimize their claims through mapping efforts, while others used naming, like the Soviets with the Soviet Plateau. Many countries sent researchers for scientific prestige, and some even brought in tourists. But this stopped after a New Zealand plane crashed into Mount Erebus, killing everyone on board. Some countries issued special stamps. The US built a nuclear reactor at McMurdo Station, and the UK considered detonating a hydrogen bomb on the ice to prove their claim. Argentina was the most upset about the treaty, as they considered Antarctica a natural extension of their territory. They made Argentine Antarctica an official part of one of their provinces, Tierra del Fuego. In Hope Bay, where Argentina and Britain exchanged gunfire in 1952, a plaque commemorates Argentina's sacrifice and claim. Argentina set up schools and mock colonies, and even had a base commander's pregnant wife give birth to the first native Antarctican, Emilio Palmer, in 1978. Surveying the land, especially what's underneath, was a key way to protect claims. Geological research was valuable for scientists and provided strong incentives for countries to fortify their presence. For example, New Zealand tried to survey the Ross Dependency in the late 1950s, but found nothing notable. The 1973 oil crisis, when OPEC countries boycotted selling oil to various Western nations, increased interest in finding stable oil suppliers, sparking speculation about Antarctica's potential resources. The US drilled over 50 sites in Antarctica to see if they could find and secure oil supplies. The USS Glomar Challenger and Japan's Hakumaru investigated petroleum deposits in the 80s and 90s. In these small but metal-rich Larsman Hills, there are four research stations. On the metal-rich Antarctic Peninsula and South Shetland Islands, there are 40 stations from 18 different nations, making up over half of all bases on the continent. As activity in Antarctica increased, more than 50 nations signed the treaty, some for research and others hoping to secure mineral rights. Questions arose about who had the right to profit from any discovered resources. Was it the one who dug it up, the one who found it first, or the one with the territorial claim? New Zealand mining companies lobbied for exclusive rights to prospect and extract minerals. 
However, smaller countries and non-treaty countries argued that any discovered resources should be shared for the benefit of all, to help equalize the natural resources among nations. They suggested that while extracting minerals from Antarctica was acceptable, the benefits should be distributed more equally. In 1988, the Convention on the Regulation of Antarctic Mineral Resources Activities CRAMRA, took place in Wellington to address these issues. The Convention on the Regulation of Antarctic Mineral Resource Activities in 1988 wasn't meant to stop mining but to regulate it. It provided a framework for how nations could explore and exploit the continent without harming the environment, and how profits would be shared between miner and claimant nations. The idea was that if the desire to mine was strong, it was better to regulate it than ban it outright. However, Australia and France refused to sign the convention, and public pressure made many reconsider mining in Antarctica. The Exxon Valdez oil spill in 1989, the largest at the time, strengthened the case against mining. Instead, the Protocol on Environmental Protection, known as the Madrid Protocol, was signed. The protocol aimed to ban mining, keep Antarctica clean, and preserve it for peaceful purposes with strict rules and protocols. When it took effect in 1998, all mineral activities and mining were banned in Antarctica. Despite the ban, the Antarctic Treaty is now being questioned. Russia has found over 500 billion barrels of oil under the Antarctic Peninsula, which is almost twice Saudi Arabia's reserves and over 14 times what the US has. At $100 a barrel, this could be worth $50 trillion. Besides oil, Antarctica has deposits of coal, iron, gold, silver, boron, phosphorus, uranium, and copper. Russia is the only country actively surveying for minerals in Antarctica under the guise of geological research, which skirts the Antarctic Treaty's ban on mineral prospecting. A 2021 Russian government report outlines a plan to study the continent's geological structures and assess its mineral potential by 2030. The state-owned company Rosgeo discovered a massive oil deposit. Despite the treaty, Russia's actions raise concerns. However, finding oil under the ice doesn't mean it can be used. With 98% of Antarctica covered by ice, extracting these resources is extremely challenging. Thus, while minerals exist, accessing and utilizing them remains a significant hurdle. Antarctica has areas of exposed rock as large as Colorado, but working there is extremely challenging due to harsh weather, moving ice, and high costs. Transporting goods and people is difficult and expensive. Extracting oil in Antarctica is currently illegal and not economically feasible unless oil prices are very high, around $150 to $200 a barrel. Russia's reported 500 billion barrel oil discovery is a deposit, not a reserve, and the extraction costs are too high to make it viable now. The Madrid Protocol bans mining in Antarctica and doesn't expire. But in 2048, countries can call for a discussion to amend or scrap the rules. Countries like China and India, major importers of crude oil, might seek to secure their own energy supplies. They have multiple research stations in Antarctica, raising suspicions about ulterior motives. As global trade becomes more competitive and protectionist, it's likely that by 2048, someone will start drilling in Antarctica, despite the economic and environmental challenges. That's all for today. If you enjoyed the video, give it a big thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thank you.